portions of scripture that are just a little bit more fun than others. Not funny exactly, well, maybe just a little. I, for one, find enjoyment in imagining what Jesus' facial expressions might have been in different situations. Like in the Gospel from Matthew that we read today, how difficult do you think it was for Jesus to refrain from rolling his eyes at the Pharisees? Or did he keep from rolling them? Where we meet up in the text today, it is Tuesday of Holy Week. The week started off well with riding in on a donkey with the crowds cheering, but Tuesday, well, Tuesday began with cursing a fig tree. And then there was the whole business of Jesus' authority being questioned. And then there were a few parables that, let's face it, were a little confusing and a little harsh. And now the Pharisees are at it again. You know when the day begins with cursing the fig tree, it's going to be a long day. Well, the Pharisees approach feigning flattery. It is obvious that they are up to something. They walk in strutting their stuff. Stuff. They're so sure that they have figured it out this time. They have a foolproof plan to get rid of Jesus once and for all. And so they ask him their question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor? Now if Jesus says yes, and all the people who have been gathering around him, all the people who detest the Roman occupation, they will turn on him. They might even chase him out of town. And that's it. End of story. The Pharisees won. But if Jesus says, no, it is not lawful. Well, then it's simple. The Romans can arrest him for treason. This is the part where I imagine Jesus rolling his eyes at the Pharisees. Because he asked them for a coin. The coin had on them the face of Caesar. And writing, stating that Caesar himself was a son of God. These coins were a constant and painful reminder of the Roman occupation. And they were, in and of themselves, idolatry. And so when the Pharisees, who are always so uptight about following every letter of the law, when the Pharisees have one of these coins in their possession, let alone in the temple, it is astonishing. And when they produce it for all to see, well, they have lost their credibility and the debate right then and there. And then Jesus uses a word that so often is translated as give, but a more accurate translation would be give back as in returning that which already belongs to another, like a library book. Give back to Caesar what is already Caesar's, and give back to God what is already God's. Well, Matthew's first century hearers were in far different circumstances than we are today in the United States in the 21st century. But they weren't all that different from others in Europe in those early centuries. So I want you to imagine with me for a moment, if you will, the HBO series Game of Thrones. Now only for a moment, because if you're anything like me, you might find that show just a little too gory. 
But when I think of the Gauls, who are a group of people who we often just kind of skip over in world civ class and don't talk a lot about in most history courses, I think immediately of the characters from Game of Thrones. Because the Gauls were a violent and bloodthirsty group. They lived in mostly Central Europe in those early centuries, a little bit before Common Era and a little bit after Common Era. They had different tribes and different leaders. And they sometimes had skirmishes among themselves, because they seemed to like that. <laughs> and they spoke a Celtic-like language. And they were Druidic in their religion. And in the middle of the first century BCE, they were conquered by Julius Caesar. But still, maybe because they were so warlike, they had constant uprisings. And so eventually, in the 5th century, they were able to overthrow the Roman occupation. Well, I bring up the Gauls because Mark Alan Powell, who is a theologian and author, writes about a legend related to the Gauls. You see, in those early centuries after Jesus, there were some missionaries that managed to make their way up into Gaul territory. And miracle of miracles, they converted many of the Gauls to Christianity. And when the Gauls were baptized, it wasn't with a sprinkling, but it was full immersion in the local rivers and streams. Now the legend is that when the Gaul warriors were baptized, they would keep one arm out of the water, often their right arm. The reason being, the missionaries later discovered, wasn't because they were afraid of the water. It was so that when they went out into battle, they could proclaim, this arm is not baptized. And then they would pick up their sword or axe and go on to destroy their enemy in a very unchristlike manner. Well, how different are we, really, from these Gaul warriors? Do we look for loopholes? Oh, I don't think any of us go around saying that one of our arms isn't baptized. But what about our time? If we look at our schedule, what we value and plan out, how much do we give back to God in daily prayer and study and service? Do we maybe say, we are baptized, but not our calendars? And what about our wallets? How do we spend our money? How much do we return to God? Our coins, our cash, may not have the face of an occupying ruler on them claiming to be a god. But how often do we make money our god? Do we maybe say, I am baptized, but not my checkbook? Or except for our patience, we are baptized and will love our neighbor except for that one. Or except for our vices. Our food or drink or other things that we like to indulge in in excess that can separate us from God and harm ourselves and others. Or except for bending our back in service except for giving an ear and listening, our minds in learning, our politics in voting. If we are to give back to God all that is God's, where does that stop? All that we have, all who we are, has been a gift. 
even Christ, on the Friday of that week, reached out his arms on the cross for us. And he didn't hold one arm back. And so maybe it's time for us to think about if everything we do, we do it for the love of God, not for the money or the power or the myth of success. Maybe it's time for us to give God glory with both of our arms. Amen.